Good evening, Canlis Community College students. Uh, I, I'm Brian Canlis, if you haven't tuned in before. It's so ex exciting to be here. My brother, Mark, is on the chat line tonight, and he's still learning. There's a mute button. Yeah, there's a mute button on your computer. But way more important than my brother uh, tonight, Morgan Chosnick yeah. from KXP, legendary radio station. You are the, hold on, Associate Director of On-Air Programming. You're also one of the DJs, Saturday 12 to 3. Yeah. You're also kind of in charge of the DJs. Yeah. You're all, you, you have a, 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 a significant role at the station. I have a big job. And in the, the small amount of time I've spent with you, I've learned that you are the world's greatest encyclopedia of Seattle music knowledge, <laughs> which is so exciting because the point of tonight's show I think we named it Seattle Music Theory Yeah. with KXP. So we're going to dive into the history of the Seattle music scene, where it's been and where it's going. I'm very excited. If people have questions, whatnot, ask my brother on the chat line. He'll interrupt from time You're to time. Yeah. Okay, stop. Don't ask him yet. I've like, I have my own questions to get through. Let's get through some of the curriculum <clears throat> first, students. Let's get it through. Okay, <laughs> let's, start, let's start with KXP. Okay. Not only is it maybe my favorite place to go, just get a coffee and hang out and listen to music, but it is arguably the world's most famous and beloved radio station. Is that a too strong of a statement? I'm very passionate about KXP, so I like to shoot for the moon and say that we are the most beloved, most well-known radio station in the world. In the world. I would say that. I mean, you uh, countries, you, you have listeners from all over the world who tune into your show who text you, who call, like, and you have bumper stickers all over the world. It's, it's, it's a radio station that, transcend, that transcends geographic boundary. Yeah, so not only the radio broadcast, but also our YouTube channel of our, our live performance videos, that's really where we're getting most of the, the worldwide audience. People are, oh, I, I'm thinking of a band, I'm typing it into YouTube, and chances are they've come through KXP or we've come to them and filmed them. And so that's how, that's the gateway for, for most people around the world to discover KXP is through our, our YouTube channel. And KXP is what it is today. I think it's worth shouting it out be, a lot because of the generosity of Paul Allen. I mean, you guys started at UW. Yeah, so the history of KXP, I think, is really interesting. We started in 1972, so we're approaching our 50th anniversary in a couple of years, which is really weird, trippy, it's but awesome. also very, very cool. Um, so it started out as a tiny student-run radio station at the University of Washington. Our call letters used to be KCMU. We used to be literally 10 watts, so you could only get it in the university district. Like just a few blocks? Like if you, Yeah. If you drove outside of the university district, you can't get it anymore. So... Um, Sometime around 1999 or so, the University of Washington decided that, because um, they hold the, the NPR affiliate license as well, KOW. Okay. So they decided they didn't want to have two radio frequencies. So um, Paul Allen was a fan of KCMU and didn't want it to go away. So uh, he was very instrumental in helping us become independent. So he helped us with um, funding to get up and running basically for the first three years. He also helped us get our first building, our old home yeah. at Dexter and Denny. Yeah. Um, and with with the intention that um, over that period of time, we would become completely independent and that's what we are today. So we're listener powered, we have fundraising drives, we do business support so businesses can support KXP. Were you there the night that Canlas opened a dive bar inside KXP? When was that? Uh, Mark, when was like two years ago? Oh, like two years two, ago. Two, three years ago. How did I know about this? We, we, we created, we had a bathtub on a, on a pickup truck full of beer. What the hell? And we had like horseshoes and bonfires. It was like, you know, we did it when she was off. I don't, apparently they did but it was so fun. It was for the, the power uh, listeners, uh, supporters the of amplifiers. KXP. Yeah. Yeah. The amplifiers. Yeah, amplifiers. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, awesome. So if you become an amplifier at KXP, you get sometimes to Sometimes you get invited to secret parties. events. That's right. And sometimes Camelus gets to throw them. Because so that, that's probably what happened. It was probably at night. I it was really. It was at night. Yeah. Yeah, you live in Bremerton. I live in Bremerton. Which is just a short ferry away. You know, just yeah. a couple hours. Thanks for coming no problem. all this way. I know you've been working from home as a DJ. Yeah. And it's not a big, it's a big deal for you to come 
out of Bremerton? You know, I mean, you come on Saturdays for your show. Yeah, I come on Saturdays for my yeah. show. It's funny because I was like, whoa, leave my house. And I was like, oh, actually, I never leave my house. This is really fun. <laughs> so thank you for well, having I'm, me. I'm so glad you're here. Let's, let's dive into some yeah. history. Okay, Seattle is a music town, period. I mean, yeah. People think of us, coffee, airplanes, computers, and I think music. Yeah. And maybe not in that order. Not anymore. Everyone thinks Seattle, they instantly go to, to grunge. Right. And the 90s. Right. And that's an important time, mm -hmm. but they'd be wrong to it think that. It is a period of time in it Seattle is, music it, history. It's this much of our history. Can yeah. you take us back to before grunge? What is the roots of Seattle music history? Yeah, totally. So I think it's I think it's really important to acknowledge um, that for hundreds of years, the Native American tribe, the Duwamish tribe, were here making music. So that's part of the soul of this city. Yeah. When Seattle started becoming occupied by others. Um, specifically in the 20th century, that's really where like the most well-documented um, modern music history of Seattle starts. So, right. uh, and it's actually very rooted in the central district. The black community has a huge, huge, huge influence on Seattle music history. So um, rooting all the way back to 1918 is, a, is one of the first recorded instances of a jazz band playing at Washington Hall which is one of Seattle's oldest, most beautiful buildings and venues. Love that space so much. Gosh, it's I've, amazing. I've, I've, ne I've never been. Yeah, it's, oh, you should go. It's a historic theater. It's so cool. It's in, it's in the, the Central District. Um, so a, a jazz band played there in 1918 for a NAACP fundraiser, and it sparked a jazz movement in Seattle, which is super cool. So um, a lot of the the immigrant and migrant populations were settling around the Yesler Terrace Central District area um, because in the 1800s, uh, a lot of the European settlers uh, were rich people who were like timber barons. Yeah. You know, you have your Yesler, you have your Denny, you have your big Seattle name, the, the rich white people, right? Yeah. Um, so they established these Victorian homes and after a while moved on from them. So there were these remnants of hotels and bars and things like that and um, they were more abandoned so they were more affordable to live in they were cheaper to live in so people were settling in that area so that's that's really where a lot of that established and I think this is so interesting so um, it's so weird to think that a hundred years ago there was prohibition in America when we're sitting here having a cocktail right now right so um, prohibition was going on at the time and and on Jackson Street in the Central District um, all of these speakeasies started popping up, these clubs, and luckily for us in our in our music history, yeah. the the government officials were like, "Yeah, you can pay me some bribes." Yeah, like, the other it, way, I don't really care. Wasn't Seattle a little more like, yeah, little, you know, prohibition? Ew, you yeah. know, we're we're off the beaten track as yeah, a, that's like an we're, East Coast thing. You know, yeah. We're far away, yeah. right? So the government officials were like, "Yeah, you can grace the palms, and you can you can have your yeah. clubs." So um, they were they were left alone f fairly well for a couple decades. So it it had time to flourish and establish in a community form. So while other cities, their club scene stalled or stagnated. They're getting broken up or yeah, you know, ours had this chance to like really dig in. Yeah and build this foundation yeah. of Seattle music during Prohibition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all of these clubs started popping up on Jackson. It's called the Jackson Street Circuit. And um, all these jazz musicians would jam together and play there, and, and Seattle became like a beacon of jazz music that was um, different than jazz around the country. You know, it wasn't the um, Kansas City sound. It wasn't the Chicago sound. It wasn't... The South, you know, is there a the Seattle Louisiana sound? sound. There was there was a Seattle jazz sound. Um, so that's that's how it was during Prohibition, and then when Prohibition lifted, um, they they actually started the police started raiding those places, um, which is too bad. <laughs> uh, but in the '40s, that's when a, a sort of a new wave of musicians came about and that's when Ray Charles came to Seattle. No way. When Quincy Jones, um, who moved here with his family when he was quite young, his father remarried 
um, their, his parents divorced, his father remarried. He moved to Bremerton because his father got a job at the shipyard during the war. So a lot of people ended up coming to the Seattle area to work at the, sh the naval shipyards okay. during Quincy World Jones war lived II. in Bremerton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, he, he says that Bremerton is where he, um, discovered his love of playing music. He and his friends found this building and they like broke in at night or something and he saw a piano and he went up to it and he started playing it and that was no like way. his, it was like electricity, like love at first sight. I always heard a story that Quincy Jones attended a Ray Charles concert in Seattle. Yeah. And that was like a big moment for him. Yeah, so he says, he says, um, so here's the interesting thing about Ray Charles. So Ray Charles is from Florida he hated Tampa. He became orphaned when he was very young. So when he was very young, um, the the ages are weird. Like on the internet, there's a lot of discrepancy. He okay. was either 15, 16, 17, 18 when he picked up and was like, I need to leave Florida and I want to get literally as far away from here as I possibly can. So he looked at a map and he was like, Seattle. Seattle. And that's the reason he came here. And so he found the community of the Jackson Street Circuit and was playing there. And people were like, holy shit, you see this guy? And he's blind too. This is nuts. Wow. So um, Quincy Jones uh, only lived in Burlington for a short time, moved to Seattle. He went to Garfield High School. And he heard that there's this blind man who is playing just this wicked music. What, so do you know what venues song. that Ray Charles played in this city? Um... So it would have been it would have been clubs on Jackson Street that okay. I think no longer exist. But I think oh man, don't quote me on this, but I think he played the show box at the market. I want right. to say. All right, I'll quote you. Yeah, I think he did. <laughs> quoted. Um, quoted. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Quincy Jones went and saw him, and he met him, and they became friends. And Quincy. I believe played on Ray Charles' first record, and he put out his first record when That's he amazing. was here. So then, um, I also want to mention an amazing uh, jazz singer who should have been as famous probably as Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, um, and that is Ernestine Anderson, who was in the 40s as well, and she, you know, toured the world. Amazing jazz artist was on Quincy Jones's label, Quest Records. Okay. Um, she joined that label and. 93 because they both went to Garfield High School like they all roamed in the same circles. Isn't that high school like known for producing an insane talent? Yeah, so it's really cool because during this time all of these people are concentrated in this high school who have this amazing love of music and talent, raw talent, and because of that there's this rich tradition of the high schools in the Seattle area producing some of the most amazing high school jazz bands to even, this day. Even today. They go to competitions. Like, Seattle area high schools win all the time jazz music competitions. And it's from this, this like, rich Seattle history yeah. of jazz music. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Okay, so how does, like, Jimi Hendrix come in? Or, mm -hmm. or yeah. who's, who's next? So, Jimi Hendrix actually didn't live here a very long time. When he was 19, he um, enrolled in the army because otherwise he probably would have been arrested for Cause, cause that something. Was the law. Yeah, but um, he went to Garfield for a time. Okay. Did not, did not graduate, left. But uh, one funny thing about Jimi Hendrix, apparently when he was a kid, he would carry around a broom and pretend to play guitar on it. And his like guidance counselor or whatever at the school was like, this kid's weird. Uh, and told his parent, his mom was like, you have to get him a guitar or I think it's going to break him mentally. He really has to have a guitar. Oh, he would play the broom before he, he owned a guitar. Yeah. He'd carry around a broom. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was uh, the 50s when Jimi Hendrix was around this okay. area. Um, but so coming into the 50s, into the 60s, so this is where I think a lot of people don't, know what the Seattle music sound was during this time. You think, oh yeah, I've heard Ray Charles, I've heard Quincy Jones, of course Quincy, Quincy Jones is off doing his massive career at this time, but you don't really think about what happens until grunge or, right, right. you know. Yeah, like what, what, what was happening in the 60s and 70s yeah. and 80s? So Seattle, act, the, the Seattle sound for decades was funk and soul which oh, a lot right. of people don't know. And it's a lot of people who are coming out of the music 
the music uh, department at Garfield as well. So I used to work. Um, We're a funk and soul town. We are a funk and soul town. I didn't. I didn't know that about us. Yeah, I know. See, I don't feel personally funky and soul filled. So this is exciting. <laughs> yeah, right. That, that's our identity as a city. Yeah, it, it really is. So um, I used to work at local record label Light in the Attic Records. Um, Light in the Attic Records has been around for almost 20 years now. They're a reissue label, so they dig and they find obscure things and they bring it to light. So that's that, what they that's do. That's all they do. That's all they do. Light, I like Light in the Attic. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, some of you may know the documentary that won the Oscar in 2012, Searching for Sugar Man, about the artist Rodriguez. That oh, yeah. Light in the Attic. I've seen that Reissued one. Cold Fact. Yeah. Rodriguez's album. Um, and then... And then that documentary went on to win the Oscar. So anyway, cool. Um, Lightning Axe reissue label. I worked there for three years, and because of my time working there, that's how I really found out about what was going on in the Seattle music scene during this time. And so I brought some yeah, records show us. to show. Show us. Um, so I really want to highlight this artist in particular, um, Overton Berry. He just passed away on Monday. And he was a huge figure in the Seattle music scene. Um, this is Overton Berry. So, what a uh, great face! What a smile! He his his mom apparently was really mean. He he like talked about her. He was like, she's a scary lady, but she made him learn piano. She made him take piano lessons, and um, he actually went to Cornish. And so he became a master piano player because of this, but um, when he was very young, I think he was only like 19, somehow he got hired as the music director for Peggy Lee's performance at the 1962 Seattle World's Fair. No way. Yeah, and the amazing thing is uh, apparently she was like super stickler, very strict, very serious, like took everything super seriously and he uh, practiced the band that he put together with her, like worked his ass off to make sure it was perfect, right? And he ran the sound in the auditorium that she performed at, and apparently after the show, it was rave reviews except for the sound in the auditorium, and so she fired him. Oh, that's, that's a bummer. So sad. But he was like, he owned up, he, you know, he's a cool guy. He's like, I, I admit, okay, fine. You know, I tried my best, and the best wasn't good enough, so that's fine. But he was also, um, he also put together, sorry, I'm taking notes because I have so much to cover, I don't want to forget what I'm talking about. He put together um, this venue called the House of Entertainment, where a bunch of jazz musicians would come and jam, and they set it up as a coffee house so that they didn't have to follow the liquor laws, and it was all ages, and they could stay open late. Cool. And so, um, in 1962, he was curating the artists that were coming through this house of entertainment, too. So, And then, in 1969, he took up a residency um, at the Doubletree Inn in Tequila. Not a place I frequent. Yeah, right? And it, you, you have to, like, you have to know where it is to get to it. It's not just like, oh, that's live music playing there tonight? Fantastic, I'll pull over. Like, you really have to know where it is. So he had a six day a week residency with his trio, the Overton Berry Trio. So this this record is at the Double Tree Inn. Um, and it got to the point where people loved his programming so much because he was working in covers, he was playing different genres of music but all on the piano with a guitar, electric guitar and electric bass accompaniment in the trio. And people just started going bananas for him, and the regulars started showing up every night, and the word started spreading. And it got to the point where there were lines out the door, double tree in, to see. It was like the hottest show in town. It was the hottest show in Tequila, in this and general Sierra, Seattle area. And uh, he he said that um, sometimes his friends were like, "When can I come see you in a at a night where I don't have to stand in line?" And he was like, "Mondays." And then it got to the point where Mondays were lines too. So um, he did that for years, but. Uh, his his claim to fame song, like his famous song, this is so funny. So somebody came up to him one night and was like, because you could request songs. Like, you have a piano player here at your restaurant. We, we do. And they play covers, right? All so, the time. Yeah, so somebody came up to Overton Berry and was like, can you play Hey Jude by the Beatles? And he was like, oh, I don't, I don't know how to play that. And the bass player was like, yeah, yeah, no, we'll play it. It's fine, I'll teach you. 
And he's like, oh, okay, man. And so he's like, don't worry about it. I'll, t I'll teach you. And so he just teaches him the last part of Hey Jude, the na, na, yeah. na, 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 na. So he learns it real quick and just uses that phrase and builds this amazing freeform song out of it with that part of Hey Jude as the backbone. And the owner came up and was like, I love that you're playing that every night. No way. And in an interview- Is that he, on the record? Yeah. Okay, I gotta hear that. In an interview, he was like, oh, Hey Jude's gonna be on my epitaph. <laughs> No way. Because it's like okay, the song he's known for. Can I find him on like Spotify or do I need to go buy vinyl to listen to? I, I'm pretty sure you can find it streaming. Okay. Because most of the light, light in the attic records you okay. can find on streaming. I'm sure you can that's, find this. That's awesome. So, you know, I just learned on the chat I was, when I was doing Mark's show with Sam, mm -hmm. someone commented that they were at the Canless restaurant in Waikiki when Frank Sinatra was at the bar drinking. Mm. And they invited him up to play at the piano. So I just learned for the first time an hour ago that Frank Sinatra played at Camless in Waikiki, just just riffing on the keys. Mom, my mom's in the audience. Mom, did you did you know that? <laughs> no, mom. I don't think we knew that as a family. I don't think we knew that. There's That's dad. Amazing. Oh, dad's here too. Yeah, dad, did you know Frank Sinatra played at Camless Waikiki? I did know. Okay, That's, we didn't know. That's amazing. But yeah, just the, this whole the, the vibe. We we love the world of piano players and musicians in spaces creating creating vibe creating atmosphere yeah yeah so um also at that time there like i said there was a huge group of musicians playing at this time and in 2010 um light in the attic put together a compilation of a lot of those artists and called it weedle's groove so this is a compilation of various artists who were playing at that time overton barry is part of that so like I'm pretty sure Overton Berry. Yeah, the Hey Jude is on here. Oh, cool. So. And it's, I see, it says Seattle's finest in funk and soul. Yeah. Wait, is that Weedle like Weedle on the Needle Weedle? Yes. So this is an amazing story. I love this story. Can I please tell this story? Yes. Okay, great. So um, the, the Weedle, the, the basketball team Sonics, and all of these artists are inter intertwined because of the Weedle. So this is really interesting. Um, I have this Weedle's Groove box set that like- Wait, so, so like the Weedle on the Needle, the kids book that my yeah. kids love, that all kids love. Yeah, so there was this author in 1974 who was like, I wanna write a book about Seattle and the Space Needle. And so made up this character called the Weedle and the, the premise of the story is the Weedle lives on top of the Space Needle. Yeah. The glowing red light at the top of the Space Needle is the Weedle's nose. And so when um, in the morning, when all of the Seattle residents wake up and they go to work, they whistle when they go to work and they wake up the Weedle and that pisses the Weedle off. He does not like that. So he makes rain clouds come and that's why it rains in Seattle <laughs> to dampen everybody and shut them up. So he's very grinchy. So everybody gets together and they're like, let's make him some noise canceling headphones. <laughs> and he's like, oh, great, thanks. And then he goes back to sleep. So that's a weedle on the needle, right? So this guy writes this and it becomes a best selling kids book. So that's around the country, right? Around the country. So that's the origin of the weedle, okay? And at that time, uh, Seattle did not have a baseball team yet. Mariner, or football. Or football. So really the only professional sports team that was going on at the time. Our dearly beloved. Seattle Supersonics. Fallen, forgotten Sonic. Not forgotten. Yeah. Not, never forgotten. They're, they'll be back one day. One day. We'll get them back. Don't you worry. Yeah. Um, they're just taking a vacation in Oklahoma right uh, now. A, a, a small break. So the author of that children's book talked to, I believe, the owner of the Sonics and was like, I want to make a Weedle costume, I want to get in it, I want to get in that costume, and I want to come out on the court, and I want to be the Weedle at the Sonics game, and he was like, no, that the, sounds stupid. Wait, the first, okay, keep going, keep going. Yeah, so he was like, okay, fine, I'm going to go sit in the stands, and I'm going to be in the Weedle's costume, I'm going to create a big scene, so either way I'm getting attention in my Weedle's costume. He's like, fine, you can be on the court. So, so the like, first Sonics mascot... So the so it becomes the first mascot ever in the NBA was a was the was Weedle. the Weedle 
and they put out trading cards and the Weedle got its own trading card. And so, a local band called Anaconda um, this is wrote, some deep trivia right wrote now. two Sonics related songs. Okay. They wrote Weedle's Groove and then on the other side was Sonic Boom. And so the song by Anaconda is how Light in the Attic chose to call the, the various songs compilation, compilation Weedle's Groove. Weedle's Groove. The end. No, we keep going. <laughs> so, um... That's in, awesome. In 2010, uh, the mayor, Mike McGinn at the time, declared it Weedle's Groove Day on September 4th, 2010, and that was also the day of the, the first day of the 40th anniversary of Bumbershoot. So a bunch of these artists got together and played a show at Bumbershoot. No way. And then they also went to Garfield and took a giant picture uh, with with as many of these artists as that you, were playing at that time as, as possible. As you've discovered the the funk soul history of this town, yeah. it, do you work that music into your show? I mean, yeah, I've, I have so much music to play, but yes, I have played some <laughs> stuff before, yeah, for sure. Um, fun fact, Yeah. Kenny G. You, uh, yeah, a local hero. Is part of the Wheels group. Okay. Of, of the, because he went it, to Garfield too. Was it big hair at the time? He had big hair at the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's let's let let's let's move into into the the um let's go to grunge. Okay. We've made our way to the nineties. I just wanna oh. mention the Sonics. Tell me real quick. Tacoma, origin of the Seattle rock scene really is the Sonics. Also wanna mention Kearney Barton, who is a producer of he, pr he recorded the Sonics, he recorded the, the Heart Sisters, Anna and Nancy Wilson, he recorded a ton of the Weedle's Groove artists. He is considered like the the godfather of, he like, he is the, he created the Seattle sound. So one last thing I want to mention is that this year Light in the Attic put out a compilation called Kearney Barton Architect of the Northwest Sound because when he died in 2012, um, they found 7,000 tapes in his house, and the University of Washington went and cataloged all of them. No way. And Light in the Attic pulled out some of, of the That's a cool the hot album. Tracks is that the one there. you're holding right there? No, this is this is actually um, before Kearney Barton died. They recorded... Um, That's another Weedle's Groove. They recorded... Yeah. Yeah, it's part of that series. Got yeah. it. So um, my coworker, Johnny Horn, who hosts... Preaching the Blues, he music directed this and put together a band and played with Kearney Barton and uh, they covered Soundgarden's Jesus Christ Pose, so now we can talk about grunge. There's the segue. <laughs> okay, what happened? What happened? I mean, the, the world exploded. We had, we had, yeah. we had the big four, right? Yeah. Uh, Soundgarden, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains. In this city, and then, uh, and then the world. Yeah. So, um, the, it is said that the Seattle sound took a, a 180 from soul and funk to what is dark and moody and angry grunge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we can't talk about these bands without talking about sub pop records. Okay. Right. So, um, okay. So Nirvana, Kurt Cobain is from Aberdeen. He recorded music, played music out there, eventually ended up moving out to Seattle. Um, my favorite Kurt Cobain story, this is very relevant. So this, is, this ties in KEXP, which is super cool. So um, Nirvana recorded a cover of this song from the 60s, originally done by Shocking Blue called Love Buzz. And I'm sure everyone knows that Nirvana song. Like it's, it's a super popular song. That's their first single ever. So. Um, Kurt Cobain drives to KCMU in the early 90s at the University of Washington, drops off the demo of the, the, Love this Buzz. Was the, this was the station with the three block radius, mm -hmm. like, because it was only 10 amps or something. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so hands, hands whoever at the station the demo. Like, here's my tape. Yeah, drives away to the edge of the listening radius, gets on a payphone, calls and requests his song, and God bless the DJ on air, they played it. And, and he sat there because it was and a sound listened. probably unlike anyone had heard before yeah 
And as as a DJ, do you have those moments when you when you hear a sound and you're like, oh yeah, and do you do you wonder if this is the next thing? Does it? Do you sometimes do you take risks like that? Oh, yeah. on the air. Oh, definitely. Yes, that's the beauty. Do you of ever KXP. regret them? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. I never regret playing music. Huh. You know, it's it's art. It's life. You know, you can you can love a song and then listen to it five years later and be like. Whoa, why did I like it so much back? You know, it's just it's yeah. just a moment in time. There's there's nothing wrong with showcasing art at the time. Wow. Um, so so they play Love Buzz and he hears himself on the radio in his car, and that's the first time he heard himself. And then um so sub pop records. So you say the top four I said the big four. The big four. It should really be the big five, because mud honey is very, very important in the grunge okay, line. Tell me why. So um, Sub Pop's very first release was Mud Honey's Touch Me I'm Sick uh, single. That was their very first official Sub Pop release okay. in 1988. Um, Touch Me I'm Sick. And this is a very interesting fact. So right out the gate, they advertised it as a limited quantity. So Sub Pop is credited with... Um, creating the that, that, the, like, fall, like that false sense of um, oh, I gotta have that I scarcity. gotta collect it yeah the scarcity, scarcity. Yeah, yeah the scarcity mindset the like I gotta have that the collector's item yes. so that that can be it could be attributed to Sub Pop huh. and then the second Sub Pop release was Nirvana's Love Buzz wow yeah so um, and then sound- does, does that mean that Sub Pop hears it on the radio at KCMU, and it was like, I love this sound. So Sub Pop was just Bruce Pavitt. He's <laughs> just a guy. Just one man. <laughs> Bruce Pavitt. Okay. So Bruce Pavitt moved out here from Illinois, um, and he moved out here with uh, Kim Thiel of Soundgarden, or and and um, uh, Hero from Soundgarden as well. So they all moved out here. And uh, Bruce Pavitt, for the first, I want to say three years, um had a zine called Subterranean Pop. And the zine would come with, I think, a mixtape or something of songs that he liked. Which is like a, a small magazine? Yeah, like a magazine. Okay. Yeah, like a newspaper, like The Rocket back in the Got day. Got it. And it came with a tape. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So he did that for a while, and then um, when he re- when he released Mud Honey's Touch Me, I'm Sick, he's like, okay, this is an official label. This is what we're doing now. This is what I'm doing now. <laughs> wow. So then, and then released... Nirvana and just had like great, great taste right away. So then in the meantime, the other who ended up being his partner at Sub Pop, Jonathan Poneman, was a DJ at KCMU. No way. And he happened to see Soundgarden play because Kim Kim and Hero moved here with Bruce. They ended up meeting uh, Chris Cornell and I'm spacing on names, but they became a band. And... Mm. Uh, Jonathan Poneman saw them play a show and was like, holy shit, that band's good, and like played them on Casey and Mew and was like, I'm not kidding, you need to know about this band. This is Soundgarden. This is Soundgarden. Wow. And and then um, reached out to Bruce Pavitt and was like, I will front the money for you to release Soundgarden. And, and then he ended up becoming the partner at, at Sub Pop, and so it was those two running it uh, until 1996. Wow. Yeah. So, and then Allison Chains was not on Sub Pop. Um, okay. And neither was, was Pearl Jam. Neither was Pearl Jam. But Do you Pearl, know that Pearl Jam m- had a lot of members that were... That Mike were, McCready himself yeah. played at the Camless Bingo Show That's true. in this very room. That's true. The legend. The, the Camless part Bingo part Show, the world's most underrated musical variety show. It's definitely the most underrated bingo show. Most underwatched M- most music <laughs> show. <laughs> I'm sure time. Mike felt that during the performance. No, no. Like, minute, He's, he is such a good uh, guy for the city. Awesome. Okay, how, he was on our board of directors, too, when we were moving into the building. Isn't he the best? Yeah, he's, he was instrumental in us moving into our, our building that we're in today. He's a great guy. Um, okay, and then so Sub Pop becomes this label that starts to launch independent music around... The, I mean, like, Seattle starts to become known for not just grunge, yeah, but indie music. Yeah, and now and now with your, like, oh, i got to collect them all, right? Right. That what Sub Pop is drumming up, and, and they're, uh, 
it is said that they've they marketed the Seattle Sound, which is grunge. So maybe they maybe they told us it's the Seattle Sound. You know maybe what I mean? They, yeah, maybe, maybe they, they did. did. It. Maybe they did. So um, so yeah, people are like, oh, I gotta hear what they're putting out next. They have a singles club that you can subscribe right. to they, over the mail, so you can be getting these new singles. It became like a culture bands. of music. Yeah, like, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow Sub Pop. Yeah, because whatever they put out is is yeah, they're cool and they're they're hip with it. So Nirvana's Bleach is really what is the that's the money maker for Sub Pop. Right? That was like, the moment, and I think I. I I learned because I've done a tour of Sub Pop mm -hmm. with those guys, and it's such a, an amazing space. That album saved them. It saved them. They were yeah. in a dark place. I mean, owning a record label is kind of a money pit. You yeah, know what right. I'm like, well, well, they're making loser T-shirts, that, and that, yeah. that was paying the bills. Yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, and then Bleach. Yeah. So a lot of times with a record label, you just you get that one album. Yeah. And that's floating everything else. So really, they were like, oh shit, 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 shit. And Bleach comes out, and it's like, Pow! to this day, that there's only two platinum platinum albums. It sells over a million copies from that, Sub Pop. Sub, Sub Pop. One of them is Nirvana's Bleach, and the other is. Can you guess? Uh, it came out in the two thousands. Postal Service. Yes. Is it? Yeah. That was an actual guess. Yeah. That's their that's other. Amazing. That's their <laughs> other platinum. Did that album. just happen? <laughs> Thank you. Well, there's like Band of Horses, <laughs> Fleet Foxes is sub pop, right? That's gold. Uh, that's a gold record. Head and Foxes. Heart. Yeah, is... that's, a, that's a gold one too, but it's not platinum. Um, All the the three Shins albums. The Shins. Mm. Come on. Yeah. Garden State. I mean, I was kind of you know sucker for that movie. You know what I'm saying? Shins attend your life. Okay. You kidding? Uh, okay, then. Um, indie music is established. And, and Seattle becomes established as this mecca of I independent music. Yeah. Um, but And we've talked about grunge, we've talked about independent music, we've talked about funk and soul. Yeah. We have talked about hip-hop. Yeah, we can talk about hip-hop. Um, that, we we also have hip-hop. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, Sir Mixed a lot, the, the grandfather. But he, like the, but yeah. like the, the Blue Scholars or even Macklemore today, like what's that scene been like in, in this town? Yeah, so... I was like, is it, I I looked, because I was like, is really Sir mix -a -Lot the first, and really he's like the first. His posse was on Broadway. Yeah, that was yes. his second single, was po My Posse's on Broadway. And it's so yeah. good. It's so good. Yeah. yeah. He, the, the story is, because he didn't really hang out in Capitol Hill, he, he lived in the Central District, and then, um. I've, if only his posse had been on Aurora. Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> you know, we, maybe we could. But uh, <laughs> my posse's at the Marco Polo Inn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, he lived in the Central District, and part of the the like ending of of racial segregation, the redlining, was the the city decided to sort of push in integration by busing students from the Central District into the the high schools in northern Up Seattle. North. So. Sir mix was being bused to, like, Eckstein Middle School and then to Roosevelt High School. Um, so that's where he was he was going, which Roosevelt has an amazing music program, too. But uh, apparently his teachers were like, you should be a music teacher. And he was like, I want to be a DJ. So um, as soon as he graduated high school, he was, he was in, like, the Boys and Girls Club down no in Rainier way. Valley um, playing DJ sets and dance nights and stuff. And then... Um, he met, uh, I'm not remembering the name, but there was a, there was a radio station, um, that was the first, that had the first rap show, and he became friends with that DJ, and then they collaborated and, and created a, a, their own little record label together, and that's when he released, um, his first song, and it blew up, and then he put out Swass. And and then uh, in 1992, that's when it, you know Baby got back. Uh, and that changed so, everything, right? Yeah. So he really he really is sort of like the the Seattle's hip hop godfather. And is, he's such um, a nice person. It was so funny too. when you were talking about a band named Anaconda earlier, yeah. where we got the the Weedle. Yeah. Is that what he's referring to when my Anaconda don't want <laughs> done? No, Anaconda spelled differently in the band. I was just checking. <laughs> Maybe it was a Seattle music history. It could be. It could, it be. could be. It could be. Maybe that's what he meant. I think he meant his penis, but... Um, <laughs> he, he also meant that. It was a double entendre. Double entendre. But um, hip-hop. So, 
yes, uh, Blue Scholars are an amazing group, but there's also this uh, this amazing collective in Seattle called the Black Constellation Collective. That's Shabazz Palaces, um, The Satisfaction, who are no longer together, but of them, from them, Stas the Boss and, and Sassy Black and... Um, Stas the Boss played here! Stas the Boss is awesome. She DJ'd our, our, our New Year's Eve party. I love her. She was our street she was DJ incredible. until recently. She moved to New York. And her sister. Is it Moni, her sister? Moni, her sister. Her no, they're, sister they're, they're is... They're just friends. Oh, they're just friends? Yeah, just Moni. Yeah, she's in Black Constellation, too. Uh, she's on our kids' show. That's awesome. That Mark and I run around in a crazy costume. Stas is the best. We she's miss the, her very she's much. She's the best. Yeah, she moved. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's an amazing hip-hop scene in Seattle of extremely... Creative, passionate, cool. smart, lovely people. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna get uh, how, Mark. How we doing? Yeah, you got like 15 minutes. You guys are good. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but I have so much more to say. I know. <laughs> I, I know. We've skipped a few a things. I know. Well, I want to say some. Just to go for a few hours. I so would. Mor Morgan, you. Morgan have, knows. Like, you have like 500 fans who are like hugely in your camp right oh, now. That's so just awesome. keep going, well, basically. You know, well, Thanks, we, we learned that okay, your show is at 12 to 3 at KXP. Yeah. Every Saturday. Yes. And you, you can, we can text you during the show and you answer. <laughs> yeah. So we, um, we are so community oriented. We love our listeners interacting with us. We're super interested in having like real-time shows so i don't really plan my show too much because i want to be working in your requests i want to be responding to world events i want to be feeling the flow of it and people connecting with me is a huge part of that so um when we do our live shows when we take mic breaks we invite people to email or text us and people write in and just say hi or and that's people from all over the world do it yeah well, yeah and also there's an earlier question around just like really radio you know because it seems so analog like so old-fashioned but isn't that really what's the difference between a live dj mm -hmm. and, and and live radio as opposed to just spotify yeah, as you yeah. have that interaction yeah, right? yeah like, talk about that algorithms are soulless and i think spotify <laughs> is the devil <laughs> and spotify is the devil what um, isn't that no talk about that is that because the 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 like if an artist gets their song played on your radio station are they uh, better compensated than if I played them on my Spotify playlist? Or? So, okay. The benefit of hearing it on KXP, for example, is I can provide you a resource to go buy their music. I can put on the playlist, here is their Bandcamp link, you should go support this artist. Whereas Spotify is interested in having... They Did you know that they ask artists to make their songs certain time lengths because psychologically they're like, oh, people only listen to a song that's three minutes and 30 seconds. So they ask artists to alter their songs to fit their fucking algorithm. I hate it. So it's, a, it's an awkward pennies. time to bring up the fact that Spotify is sponsored this hour. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I wish I'm you would have told now. me that before. Uh, oh, you did. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so, you know, um, there's, there's nothing that can beat the human connection. There's nothing that can beat the surprise that huh. you feel when you hear what a human has picked for you to hear next, the connection that it's made. When you're listening to an algorithm, you're like, that song didn't go with the that last song. That, ugh, that was a terrible transition. Why am I listening to this now? Huh. Or, you know, you get an ad thrown in the middle of it. Or... Um, you know, it, it only cycles through, like, five different artists, but you're not maybe going to... Well, sometimes I play the same artist if there's a reason, but you're not going to hear a lot of repeats. You're going to hear me going down all different pathways, you, but it's all going to make sense because I'm I'm being very purposeful about, like, what are the sounds connecting those two songs? Because you, you have m literally millions, millions of, songs of songs at your fingertips. At my fingertips. And yeah. how is that not the most overwhelming, anxiety-producing thing to choose? So like, how do you choose what comes next? How do you choose the paths that you take? Well, it takes a lot of practice. It was like a panic attack every time I was on the air for like the first mm, four years. But after, after a while, it becomes uh, more second nature, but... So, you know, I, I definitely have songs that I know I want to play during a show, for example. Um, I also, uh, as, a, as a rule, at KXP, we play half new music every hour 
particularly on the, the variety mix shows because we have specialty shows where they dig into a genre and not you don't have to necessarily play new music but for my show in, uh, in particular I'm a variety variety mix show because I can play any genre of whatever want. I want so half of an hour I'm playing brand new music so I know that right and then my my goal is to build context around that new music that you've never heard so that it becomes familiar to you. So I'm playing a brand new song you've never heard, and if it reminds me of David Bowie, yeah. now you've made that connection in your mind, and that's that new thing isn't scary anymore. Cool. It's accessible to you, right? There's there's context around it. I'm also working in people's requests. I'm also like responding to world events. Um, it can be as simple as, you know, it's been cloudy for six straight months and today is a right. sunny day and now yeah. I'm like, let's play sun songs. And everybody's like, yeah, let's play sun songs. You said, you said earlier to me that you receive a ton of demo tapes, just like Kurt Cobain sent in all the time. Yeah. Like how many I do you get? I get people a... emailing me. I get, uh, They're not tapes anymore, I guess, are they? They're, they're <laughs> digital, yeah. And It's better for the environment. Like how many do you get <laughs> and do you listen to all of them and do you play some of them? Dear and... Lord, I try. <laughs> I, try to, I try to listen to all of them. I get... And do you know right away, like, this is actually good and this is not good? Well, I don't say good or not good. I, I say, apologize. what are my preferences? Okay. What is my personal taste? Okay. Because your art is your art and good for you for making it. What is my personal taste? Yes, of course. So I get probably between 10 to 30 a day in my inbox. And I... Because I'm, I also have big jobby job that requires emailing. I throw them into a folder Got immediately, it. and then I at, I try at least once a week to go in that folder and go through everything since the last time I went through it. Is that what you do on the ferry? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Just like listen to music. Yeah. When, when when's the last time you heard a song that you actually like stopped you? You were like, oh, this is this is awesome. So my r most recent earworm, and this is probably going to double up as an answer to another question later, but <clears throat> um, local band Deep, Deep Sea Diver oh, yeah. just put out an amazing album Yes. called Impossible Wait. Yes. And the title track, Impossible Wait, has been in my goddamn head for a month. It's, it's so all I can hear in my head. Good. It's and so we, good. We talked about this because... Um, one of the field trips yeah. that Camelot Community College is going to do, it's not really a field trip, but we're, we're going to go to our parking lot and we have a, class. we're going to do a drum circle. Yeah. We're going to have a bonfire. We're going to drink whiskey and Deep Sea Diver is going to come lead us in a <laughs> drum circle in our parking that lot. That sounds really fun. Morgan, you should come. You, you should do. come. When is that? Uh, we haven't announced it yet, right? No, I think it's coming. I, I don't think it's coming. Tell me later. Tell me details later. Uh, yeah. Week, yeah. But it's coming. We'll talk. Because Deep Sander is one of my favorite bands that the city's ever produced. They're extremely talented. Yeah. Um, and we played their entire album on release day. Did you know that? I did At, not. On KXP? No, you played the whole thing start to finish. We played one song per hour, and Jessica recorded herself talking about every track. Isn't she the best? Yeah. It was amazing. So for 12 straight hours, <laughs> we played the whole Deep Sea Diver album. And her husband's the, the drummer. A lot of people don't yeah. know that. Yeah. And he's... Like the kindest man. Uh, so that's a song recently where I'm like, that's a hit. Like you heard that's it and you're jam. like, boom, yeah. done. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm hosting a party at my house. Mm -hmm. And I want to build a playlist and I'm, you know, how do I do that? How, how, what, what advice would you give me if I want to be a, a, a DJ? So the first thing you want to consider is what kind of party is it? Is it a chill atmosphere? Is it a party atmosphere? Are you getting drunk? It's sadly not a rager. Dance? I have three you know? small kids, but yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, like figure out the what, mood. What's the mood, yeah. okay? Now, you also have to think about your audience, who's going to be there for content, but also for for uh, what do you think people would like? Because there's nothing worse than a mix that you've made that everybody just is like not into. That's sad, right? You're only programming for yourself in but that do you, case. But do, do, do I focus on hit, hits that people know or do I try to, do you try, do you try to educate your audience at the same time? Well, I think what you wanna do is exactly what I just said about what I do in my show, where you play a familiar thing to hook them. Got it. And then you introduce them to something they're gonna love that reminds them of the other thing. 
right? So you don't want to get too obscure because otherwise your audience will be tuning out what you're playing at your party. Right. So you want to obviously play some play some bangers, play some things that people are going to know and love. And then if you want to introduce them to something new, you can slip it in that way, you know? Slip it in. Just slip it in. Uh, Mark, I got a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. Like, kind of like I, I know. I, I know we're getting low on time. Is, is it okay if I? Can we do just sort of like a rapid fire? Rapid fire round. Rapid fire okay. questions to Morgan, not me. Okay. Yeah. So uh, here we go, Morgan. Um, a lot of okay. I can't. I can't overstate. I would. I would be doing the chat an injustice if I didn't just say directly to you. A lot of fans out there, and they're <laughs> loving what you're doing. They love you. I think we need to do KXP Yay. music drink and... 201 and 301 and, and, and PhD Cheers, levels. friends. So we're going to keep this up somehow. Glad you're having a nice time. Okay, a couple of questions here. Um, one, what is the best way like, to support the Seattle music scene like right now? You can't go to live venues, yeah. and people are sort of looking at, like, you know, from an insider's point of view... Um, you know, what's a great way to support just if you're into this and you're tracking, like, how do you do this? Yeah, so um, specifically with the venues being closed right now, there's there's a, a campaign that just launched recently called uh, Keep Keep Music Live Wa.org, I believe. Okay. Um, they're, they're actively collecting donations for our local venues. If you've been around Seattle at all and you've walked by any of the major venues like Numos for example, they have big mock signs on them that say that you know those construction signs they're like this is going to turn into condos. Yeah. It looks real. It gave several people a heart attack when they saw it, but it's like this could be the future if we don't no act way. now and help. So, um <clears throat> That's a great way to help the venues specifically, to help artists specifically, because obviously to make money, especially when they're releasing new albums, they have to tour because really touring is where the money is. So um, buying their albums is and their merch is the best way you can support like, artists right now. Di- like direct feed to, direct, the, to the artist vein. Direct As opposed to, to maybe going love our neighbors down, the, the Amazon folks here that are building this city single-handedly but maybe like if you want to directly support an artist just go buy the album yeah so right? if like you want to buy their physical stuff you can either buy it directly from them most artists have band camps band camp is a very benevolent organization every first friday of every month during this pandemic they're doing um 100 of all album sales go directly to the artist the first okay. friday of every month so if cool. you're if you want to wait a little bit wait till the first November like, 1st. Or the, the first Friday. Right Excuse ago. me, the first buy Friday. Buy Deep Sea Diver on the 1st. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, but this... double whammy, support your local brick and mortar record stores. N- next question is a little bit crystal ball themed okay. here. Um, we're, we're looking to know from you the next Seattle music genre. Oh. Genre? Genre. Like, like. Well, it says genre. I don't, I don't make this <laughs> stuff up. I try to <laughs> accurately represent the thread that's going on. You know or, what? Or, take, or, or or the bands she's most excited about well, coming out. We, we sort of say grunge kind of came from Seattle, and other sort of major movements came from Seattle. Is there anything maybe that we're seeing emerge right now that could that could, you know, produce a genre? Hmm. Well, I think there's um, there's a few bands that are creating rock music that I think is. M- more original and less derivative, but is still in the rock umbrella. Uh, Black Tones are a great example of that. I love them so much. Not only that, but Eva Walker is our Audio Oasis host on KXP, but they're an amazing band. Um, Black Tones. Black Tones. Uh, Black Ends is another... Holy crap. That lady's voice is so awesome. The Black, Black Ends. Black Ends, yeah. They, um, I can't wait. They, she just put out an EP called... Stay Evil. That's a really good EP. It's really good. Stay Evil. It's cool. Uh, the song Monday Morning is very good. Yeah. Um, I think that's Trump's campaign promise. <laughs> oh, stay Evil? That's right. Make America it's Evil his, again. It's his new poster. <laughs> Let's just keep it the way it is. Sorry, I apologize. Wait, music, um, music. So when you see trends coming, you know, and it's like the, the movements or the, or the things that are exciting to you like like what are you, like what is exciting to you about right now and like what's happening in music in this in this city yeah i feel like we're we're almost in a post trend environment because um, the 
the internet and the way that people produce music is has leveled the playing field in a way where you're there's not as much sound gatekeeping does that make sense so like during there was a period of time in in seattle where it was like wow that's a lot of folk bands you know yeah because that's what who were getting signed that's who you were being served to hear that's who was getting the shows at the venues you know Mm -hmm. um i feel like we've gotten to a place where there are a lot of really amazing talented bands in every sort of genre like the true loves are a killer soul band um uh uh odessa is an electronic duo that um in the last two years like broke out of seattle and is selling out stadium shows and that's electronic you know so there's just there's so many different genres in seattle um i highly recommend if you're really interested in learning the the newest best music you should listen to the local show on kxp hosted by eva walker called audio oasis which is saturday six to nine she's scouring the city for the best new local music and you will hear it on her show yeah and and, and that's been the tradition of audio oasis two quick ones ready for this um i don't know if you can do this favorite favorite venue oh i mean we have some cool i love them all but i think um as as an audience member, I have I always have the best time at Showbox Market. Showbox Market. I also if, really love Numos. If you could watch any historical Seattle show in any venue Ooh. at any time, what Ooh. would that one wow. show be? Wow, it's just like you know, what's your favorite children right now? These are tough questions. I know. I, this is my favorite it, I didn't say your favorite. Just you choose one. Like, is there is 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 there is there an artist in history at it? Is it the Double Tree? I mean. That would be amazing to see Overton at the Double Tree. That would be very, very cool. I would not mind that at all. Okay, so we skipped Country Western. I don't know if that was intentional. Is there no. any Seattle Country Western we should be paying attention to? Is or there any? Are we just not. There country? is? Yeah, of course there is. Okay. Um, come on. <laughs> can we, can There's we go every there for genre, a second? is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, okay, so um, two. Here's, here's an example of two major country or country ish artists that have come out of the Seattle area. One is one of my favorite artists of all time, Nico Case. Oh, yeah. I mean, come on. And then Brandi Carlisle, of course. Oh, she's the freaking best. Oh, I yeah. I say her name earlier. Should have said that. Have she's said country-ish. That. Yeah. Gosh, she's Point. good. She's very good. Yeah. And um, her wife is the greatest. And there are other bands, and I cannot... That's okay. There's so many. Think yeah, on the spot right now. We're, but yes, there are, of course, there are. Time, <laughs> we're nearly out of time. Which, I don't know if there's anything you, that you want to particularly close with. I'm going to scroll through the thread here real quickly. But Yeah, okay. Um, I do have something fun. I uh, I teased this earlier, and I don't know if you know that we could possibly pull it off or not. And I'm seeing that I think we can do it. I... I, oh, I, you're, like, you're like, what are you doing? Second, What's happening? It's, is it true that you were the lead singer mm-hmm. of a band? <laughs> yes. Back in the... Uh, it was 2008 to 2010. And the name of your band... The Broken Knives. Which you can't find anywhere. No, we didn't really say anything. You can't find it. We broke up before the album came out. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> You know how um, you do. But you're a great singer. And uh, I, you? when I was working with, with Dean at KXP on this, this whole class, I, I learned that you happen to be an insanely spirited and a, an accomplished karaoke singer. <laughs> And I think our audience would, a, would appreciate nothing more. Well, look at than, this. Than, <laughs> than my bro- <laughs> Mark just crawled on. Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> you know, the microphone. Um, How convenient. Do you think? Do you think you could close us out with uh, your first live performance since 2008 when you were the lead singer of The Broken Knives? Uh, I don't is that think even it's true? the first because I've done a lot of karaoke. But that, yeah, but this is different. This is not karaoke bar. Oh, this is Canless. This restaurant. is Canless Restaurant. We've had people play here, um, all kinds of legends and institutions, from Wynton Marsalis to, uh, oh, who was the country guy that just blew our minds? We had Cockrell. We had Lone Bellow. Um, did you have Orville Peck? No, uh, no, um, uh, Chris Christopherson. Oh, you had Chris Christopherson? Yes! Holy yes. shit! Yes! That's awesome. Amazing. He played for an hour and a half. Yeah. Here. Okay. 
Anyway, I, I think it's time. Um, so we were we were going through. Uh, I'm a I'm a child of the '90s. Me too. Um, and is there uh, and there, if there's one song that everyone knows, it's Lisa Loeb. Um, you say stay. D uh, but isn't it stay? Oh, the song is called. It's called. It's called. It's called stay. stay. Can, Can you sing for us? Can we do that? Yes! yes! Let's do it. Yeah. Come on, Morgan! All right. Woo! I'm just gonna... Five. Ladies and gentlemen, big concert. <laughs> Morgan Chosnick. You say... KXP legend. I only hear what I want to. Now, if you're not singing along at home... I feel like you should hold my You're missing a significant opportunity. And you say... I talk so all the time, so. This is karaoke bar. And I thought what I felt was simple, and I thought that I don't belong. And now that I am leaving, now I know that I did something wrong, cause I missed you. Yeah, I missed you. Oh, the 90s. It's this week a new part of your show, right? And you say <laughs> I only hear what I want to I don't listen hard Don't pay attention to the distance that you're running To anyone, anywhere I, I don't understand If you really care, I'm only hearing negative No, 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 no So I, I turn the radio on I turn the radio on And this woman was singing my song It's me, love is Someone's hovering when we're weeping for the other who was dying since the day they were born. Well, well, this is not that. <laughs> Never one, but I'm thrown. Yeah. Mm. I thought I'd live forever, but now I'm not so sure. You try and tell me that I'm clever, but that you won't take me anyhow or anywhere with you. That's why we saw karaoke goes. You're like, where am I? You said that it was naive, and I thought that I was strong. No. I thought, hey, I can leave, I can leave, oh, but now I know that I was wrong, cause I missed you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I missed you. Morgan. Morgan. You're the greatest. I love that you just did that. Thank you. KXP, you guys, tune in Saturdays. Uh, through, I don't know where the camera is, I was supposed to talk to you. Tune in Saturdays, 3 to 6, to listen to Morgan. Support. Oh. Noon to three. Noon, Twelve to three. Support your local radio. Give online at kxp.org. Go to your record stores. <laughs> support Seattle music and all music. Yeah. What a joy to have you here. I've learned so much. Can we elbow? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. <laughs> that was fun.